talk about something today. So, <laughs> um, a little while ago, a very short while ago, um, we were, I was discussing with the res what I was going to talk about today. And so we were putting, you know, coming up with some ideas and I said, you know what? Turns out I was the first speaker in the Courage to Shine series at the beginning of this whole journey when Rev Kev left for Harvard. And I was like, well, why don't I talk about kind of the lessons I've learned, the, the challenges and triumphs over the past year. And they were like, I like that direction. And then the next day, Rev Kev says, well, why don't you also draw from the book that I purchased you way back yonder at the beginning of the year, uh, The Light We Carry by Michelle Obama. And I was on a busy, really busy day. So I was like, thumbs up. I was cracking up that he thought I could complete a book this year. <laughs> I was like, okay. So all week, I literally was like, <laughs> I'm at the dentist's office waiting, reading. I'm at award ceremonies in between awards. I'm like, <laughs> and you know, I got it done. And I was really excited to, to know that not only is it quite an easy read and very refreshing, but it's also very much aligned with the self-love work that I teach and core unity principles. So I'm excited to share a little bit today. So today's talk is entitled, The Light We Carry, Finding a Way Out of No Way, which certainly describes the moments throughout this year that I've had while Rev Kev is away. <laughs> but I'm gonna start with the broader worldly context and then drill down to aspects of my personal journey. So um, I like to call her First Lady Obama, so I'm just going to go with that. <laughs> First Lady Obama is known for the saying, when they go low, we go high. And every time I think of this saying, I literally think, when there's hate, challenge, or adversity, choose love. That's what I hear. And I'm known for saying love is everything. I'm known for believing that love is everything, and it is. And God is love. One thing that I know without a doubt is that God has been with me through my entire life journey, and that was no different this past year. Every time I have chosen love over anything else, like fear, doubt, desperation, worry, yeah, you name it, pick your poison, <laughs> I become abundantly aware of the God in me, the God around me, and the God that enfolds me. The revealing, world by, the revealing word by Charles Fimo says, Love is the great harmonizer and healer. Whoever calls on God as Holy Spirit for healing is calling on divine love. Divine love will bring your own to you. It will adjust all misunderstandings and make your life and affairs healthy, happy, harmonious, and free. That is all true and it sounds great, but it's not always easy to choose love. I'm going to read from page 274. Now I do need glasses. I'm reading glasses. That's a thing that happened this year. Um, <laughs> let's get it right here. All right. So she says, but wait, have you seen the world lately? How much worse can things get? After George Floyd died with a police officer's knee on his neck on a Minneapolis street corner in May 2020, people wrote me asking whether going high was really the correct response. After the Capitol building was marauded, after Republicans, uh, Republican officials continued to support false and undermining claims about our election, they wondered something similar. The provocations are endless. We've seen more than a million Americans die in a pandemic that highlights every disparity in our culture. The Taliban has banned girls going to school in Afghanistan. In the United States, our own leaders have moved to criminalize abortion while communities are routinely devastated by gun violence and hate crime. Trans rights, gay rights, voting rights, women's rights all remain under attack. And any time and anytime there's another injustice, another round of brutality, another incident of failed leadership, corruption or violation of rights, I get letters and emails that pose some form of this same question. Are we still supposed to go high? She says yes, and I say yes. But don't worry, she gives us lots of good guidance on how to do that. So first she says we are to decode fear. We are to remove the mystery out of it and dive deep into what's really underneath our fears. Most of the time it's the introduction of something new or the introduction, introduction of some sort of change or something that's like so big that we don't know whether we'll get through it. She talks about when her husband asked her about running for president. He told her if she said no, this whole thing gets shut down. And when Rev Kev was asking to leave for Harvard, it was a similar situation. <laughs> At first, it just seemed really big and scary. I think I talked about that 
at another talk that I gave. But um, then I started doing the inner work. I started processing. I started saying things out loud that I could be scared of, like, what if we don't make it through? What if we, our relationship can't make it through this year? What if the kids don't understand why he went away? What if I can't do this? Then I started like, well, how do you sound? <laughs> you certainly don't sound steeped in spiritual principle. You certainly don't sound steeped in the truth versus the facts, the appearances, right? And so after, you know, Rev. Deborah Johnson spoke, let's give it up for Rev. Deborah Johnson, who was one of our current society speakers, and she said, doubt is separation from what we know. So then I started thinking about what do I know? I know that I want to support my husband's dreams. I know that we will always do what's best for our three children. And I know that I can do this. I got, I'm that powerful, right? So people felt like it was a big ask for Rev Kev to say, you know, can you hold it down here? And yeah, it was. But the thing that people also don't realize is that many years ago when I wanted to venture off from engineering and then we found out we were pregnant, I really wanted to raise the children the way I really wanted to raise them since birth. And so he took on the, the role of supporting the family so I could do that and navigate my own purpose-filled career. So we do this for each other, and I just want to make sure that while it seems like a societal norm the way we have it set up, it was an intentional agreement that he and I made. And it is evolving, of course, as they get older, the children get older. But we really both wanted to have a true home, and we really wanted to have dreamy, purpose-filled careers. If that ain't dreamy, I don't know what it is, right? Let's give it up for Rev Kev. So decoding the fears means just process your emotions and find your way to the truth, and then fear becomes powerless, yeah? She then talks about the power of small. She says that the big stuff becomes easy to handle when you deliberately put something small alongside it. She recommends working on something small that not only soothes you, but that you can really bring home. Like, yeah, I did that. <laughs> she goes on to say, when my brain apprehends nothing but monolithic catastrophe and doom, when I feel paralyzed by not enoughness, I pick up the knitting needles. She took on knitting. At the start of the school year when RevCab was headed off, uh, the task at hand for me was quite huge. Not only because of duties as a mom, a working mom, but also because of this greater context. There are times when I feel like the world is crashing down around us and I'm here trying to raise three little humans. And it's big. The reality is I didn't even realize how big my responsibilities were from taking one ch child to her new high school and her making the transition from uh, private school to public school and taking on cheerleading and continuing to dance and another child getting a full scholarship to take as many dance classes as she wanted all year and she did. <laughs> and Kate and our youngest deciding to venture off into JV basketball, street hockey and a newly budding social life. Add to that some big work goals that I had, and it all quickly seemed insurmountable. So I've been putting in the inner work for many years. I talk to you all the time about how I work out, and I come to unity, and I release a lot here, and I eat a lot of comfort food for balance, of course. And I have lots of call a friend lifelines. I have done that three many times. But this unprecedented set of circumstances called for something new. And now as I was reading about uh, the power of small, I realized for me that was walking our dog Sanchez. You see, at the beginning of the year, we were all trying to catch our bearings. We were like, how am I going to get this one over here and that one over there and be in two places at once and ensure that the children have healthy, thriving social lives, which I find particularly important post-pandemic, keep up with work goals, current contracts, and, and actually have something nourishing in their bodies. <laughs> how am I going to do this? So walking the dog was like not even on our radar. He has his little uh, doggy door and, you know, we get to the walk if we get to the walk. And it wasn't until he had a little health challenge that we realized he needed more exercise. So then I was on it. Then I was like, all right, I'm going to walk him a mile and a half in the morning. That would be my pre-workout. And I had it all set up. I did a midday workout. I mean, a midday, well, did <laughs> a midday walk and then the kids would get the early evening walk. And here's the thing. When I was on the walks, I could literally feel myself tense up. Oh my God, what if Kaden forgot his lunch? What if I'm missing a coaching session? What if I didn't get this right? What if I have to take two of them and pick this one up and do it? And I could feel it in my body and anxiety. And I'll just breathe, 
roll my shoulders back and be like, Anita, you allocated this time to walk the dog. Enjoy it. Be fully present. Watch the blades of grass blowing in the wind. Let Sanchez sniff every single <laughs> blade of grass he wants to. And he certainly does. <laughs> but I, I really, it brought to mind, like, all our needs are met as a family. We're all safe. And, and at the bottom line, just pipe it down, Anita. But what are other people going through who don't have that? And it really just brought things in perspective. So while walking the dog might seem like no big deal, for me it was that small thing that I deliberately put alongside the big thing so that I could stay grounded in love. Next, Michelle Obama says to start kind. Now, here at Unity, we got that on lock. If you came in here without having a happy hello or even a hug, you came in through a side door that we don't know about. <laughs> I think we've got kindness on lock here, right? We've got love on lock. But what she talks about in this chapter is she talks about a friend of hers, husband, who every morning looks in the mirror and says, hey, buddy. She's talking about self-love. She's talking about being kind to ourselves, extending love to ourselves. We are our, we are our highest bar setters and our harshest critics when we don't meet it. So I don't pretend to have gotten every decision right this year. I have had apologies to make to myself, apologies to my children to make, apologies to my husband, friends, and colleagues. But I've also forgiven myself. I have, if I have had any negative thinking, I work on it immediately to release it. Because if I don't, it impedes me. And if I didn't and hadn't, there would have been no way to find a way through this year. First Lady Obama says to box out our inner critics and push our gladness to the forefront and give ourselves some speck of kindness each day, even when it's hard to. Along those lines, she talks about being seen. Rewriting the story of not mattering takes both courage and persistence. It's not something that you conquer in one, two, or even a dozen times. It takes work to get yourself out of other people's mirrors. Let me say that again because I think that's one of my favorite lines of the book. It takes work to get yourself out of other people's mirrors. It takes practice to keep the right messages in your head. And I say, yes, it does. It takes a lot of persistence and courage, both in the context of our own thoughts and beliefs about ourselves, but also in this greater context of society. She goes on to say, it is also helpful to acknowledge what makes this work so difficult. We are tasked with trying to rewrite our own script over layers and layers of already written ones. She's referring to the deep-rooted racism and discrimination that is deeply embedded in our society. One of the new projects that I worked on this year was a um, workshop series for men and for women, and then we had a co-ed. So we were doing these workshops for the men group, workshop for the women group, and then we did a co-ed session, which that was the most liveliest. <laughs> we came back together because we were talking about intimate relationships and how self-love plays a role. But at one of the workshops in the men's group, I was talking about how important it is to share yourself authentically in intimate relationships, into me, you see, right? So like for real, uninfluenced but what I, by what I call less than messages. So he was grappling with this idea of being authentic and, and not being affected by these messages. He, he explained to us, uh, after raising his hand, you know, it was virtual, so I see the little hand raised. He explained to us that being a black man in America is there's so many experiences that are so deep rooted. He has trouble deciphering between what is influencing his self-concept and what is actually authentic. And who am I to take away his experience at all? So we went in. It was so powerful. He was so courageous. And his willingness to share his truth got everybody involved. And that's the thing. Sometimes we're holding back some parts of ourselves. And when we share of ourselves fully, when we aren't afraid to raise our hand when we feel unseen, then it changes the world. It helps others. First Lady Obama also says to have your kitchen table. What does that mean? That's her group of friends, her core group of friends. She says, Barack and I have never tried to be each other's everything in life. To single-handedly shoulder the entire load of care that each of us requires, 
We have other forms of emotional rescue and relief. We are carried by a wide array of friendships. Now you all know, that's the truth, that I will never be Rev Eric, his bestie, <laughs> and I'll never be attorney Burby Power, <laughs> his other bestie. But the truth is this past year, I could not have done it. I leaned in on my friends. And I also leaned in on making new friends. There's nothing like trying to figure out how to get one child to one place and another child to another place that kicks you, <clears throat> go make a friend. What's your friend's parents' name? <laughs> and I've made such rich friendships with parents of their friends and I'm so grateful. It's just made the year really fun, very enriching, very lovely. So I just wanna take this moment to everyone who has given a Ross kid a ride Everyone who has taken them after school, taken them in when I couldn't get to them in time, attended a school function, a basketball game, sent a DoorDash gift card, gave their favorite simple recipes, frozen meal deliveries, Candy and David, yay. <laughs> bringing dinner over to break bread together, rooting me on from the sidelines every Sunday, talking to me, pulling me aside, and asking how I'm doing. Please know that I appreciate all the love and all the support, and you're very much been a part of me getting through this year. So um, she closes the book on a very powerful chapter called Be Aware of the Armor You Wear. Be aware of the armor you wear. She says, I know from experience that our armor can often serve us, but I also believe that in many instances it can be defeating or at least exhausting, walking around wearing too much of it being too defensive, too prepared for combat, and it'll slow you down. I hear from first ladies of churches all the time who are trying to strike the balance of how much they share of themselves and how much they wear their armor, right? How much they have that defense or how much they put on their outside appearance. My advice is always the same, be authentic. It doesn't mean share everything. It actually just means draw from that deep place within you that's rooted in love. And you will find the answer every time on how to show up. I can truly say that there have been some rough times this past year. <laughs> Moments like when my knee has felt like it's going to explode waiting on a red light because I've literally been holding the gas pedal or brake pedal for the 11th pickup or drop off for the day. <laughs> Still working on that. Working on that. <laughs> Moments when I've wondered desperately if I can actually truly keep my children safe. Moments like witnessing a client turned friend become unhoused. Listening to a client's story riddled with trauma, self-load, despair, but also victory. So horrific and inspiring that all I could do was let out a big cry once I left that session. Aging parents who live on the other side of this nation. Gut-wrenching losses to suicide and homicide. Dear friends moving through challenging medical diagnoses. Moments when Rev Kev and I were not seeing eye to eye and the distance seemed to be taking a toll. Moments when I've had to look into my child's face. <sighs> Amongst the confusion of the world and the quasi-normalcy of our family situation and assure them that I see them, that they are loved unconditionally, and that everything will be okay despite appearances. Moments where no book I've read, no note I've taken, no quote I've written, no Instagram reel I've seen, no sermon I've heard, not one piece of academia, was going to provide me with the answer to who do I get to be for my child so I can get through to them. It's been hard. And those who I've reached out to know that my armor has been down. But there's something that has really stood out for me through it all. There's been this inner peace that has kept me afloat. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who, has, who goes with you, who will not leave you nor forsake you. It's that intangible thing when, within us that opens us up and allows us to lean in deeply on love, that very love that strengthens us, the very love that fuels us. When the world is worlding, when life is lifing, and when children are teeming. Suddenly then, then the words come, the divine idea has come, the strength that has come to address any and all situations at hand arrives. 
Again, like the revealing word said, divine love will bring your own to you. It will adjust all misunderstandings and make your life and affairs healthy, happy, harmonious, and free. It has been a miraculous journey this year. And I'm always saying that it's not just about the results, it's also about the journey, but I sure do, ensure, I sure do enjoy some extraordinary results. <laughs> like the smile on my husband's face when he graduated from Harvard. Every ceremony, there were lots of them, that we went to, he had this smile, it was different. It was different, it was beautiful, it made all of this so worth it. It's like Angelina receiving the Coach's Choice Future All-American and High GPA Awards and cheer. <laughs> Camila back there being promoted to point class, meeting one of her dance idols as she fitted her for her new point shoes and making it onto the competitive dance team. Kaden, who got gold honor roll all year round medal, student athlete of the year, <laughs> most improved on the JV team, JV basketball team, and four other awards. And here's one of the most special ones as well. When I went to um, Boston and I didn't know all the people who were gonna come to come support Rev, and it turns out one, his goddaughter, who is like a longtime mentee of ours, um, I hadn't seen her in over 15 years. Her name is Chloe. And she came and she saw me and we just hugged and tears just immediately came down. And from that point, it's like we never like missed a beat. She was filling me in. She's married now. She's a lawyer now. And I'm like, ah, it's so great. And then she went back to um, D.C. where she lives and I checked in on her. And we're texting, and she says, also, kind of unre unrelated, but I wanted to say the kids are so great, and you're doing such a great job. It was empowering, empowering to see your agility, nimbleness, and communication style with them. You're a superwoman. So yes, there are times when we are abundantly aware of the light we carry, when someone acknowledges our shine, when we accomplish big things like Harvard degrees, awards, accomplishing our goals. But we're also shining our lights when we share our story, even when it's hard or painful. We're also shining our lights when we strike up a conversation with someone we don't know, when we get out of an abusive relationship or a toxic envir work environment, when we don't go back to drugs or alcohol, when we say no so that we can rest instead, when we ask for help, when we let out the big ugly cry. The light we carry is love. The way out of no way is love. So do the inner work it takes to choose love, because after all, love is love. Thank you. <laughs>